Yeah, you should get involved in, in serving because it's the right thing to do. <laughs> That's a good answer. Um, there's a, ser a service that I can remember. Um, Pastor Jeff had, had said it a couple times about getting out and doing more than just coming to church on Sunday, feeling good about yourself and, and going on your way the rest of the week. And kind of felt like he was talking to me that, that hey, you gotta, gotta do more. There's more than just coming here. Um, at that time, Growing to Serve had just become a new thing at church that was the past uh, renovation, the, the lower section with the Shepherd's Heart Food Pantry, all the office space, kids station, all that remodeling. They had put a, a call out to come and serve, and I thought this is perfect for me, my construction background, let's do this. And, and so I did, I made that decision to go and get involved and uh, on the ride from Melbourne's, I remember telling myself several times, uh, you can turn around, you don't have to do this. Uh, it's outside my comfort zone to, to step out of that shell. But I got here and I got out of the car and I, I walked in and it was awesome. Uh, a bunch of good guys tearing down concrete walls and saving the church a whole bunch of money in the process. After coming that first time and, and getting involved, it was kind of like uh, it just started, it ignited and that drive to, to serve became more and more real and got bigger and bigger. And Haley from Emmanuel House, uh, one of our Serve the World partners, had spoke at West Campus. And again, I felt like this was God telling me to, to go, go to that meeting after service. So my wife and I did, and we signed up. And the first project in Emmanuel House was remodeling uh, one of the apartments. This building was in terrible shape. I met a bunch of good guys. Uh, the whole entire C group had signed up to be a part of it. And so I got to hang out with some older guys that were really involved. And so that kind of rubs off on you. When you go and serve, not only do you get filled up, but other guys around you fill you up too, and you fill them. And it's, it's kind of cool how it turns into this fellowship thing. Um, we got really involved. We remodeled that first apartment. We remodeled the second apartment. And then things kind of changed. Um, I had hurt my back. Uh, I got seriously hurt and uh, needing a surgery. And so things kind of changed into, maybe there's another way I can serve this, this uh, ministry. And once again, God kind of said, hey, you should do a concert, which I don't do anything musically. I don't play any instrument, uh, produce any type of show. And for some reason, uh, decided to put on an event with Danny Koki. What, stemmed the whole thing or started it all was heading out to Phoenix for Christmas and there was Danny uh, right in front of me on the plane. I mentioned to my wife, hey, that's, that's Danny Goki and we left him alone. We, we flew to Phoenix and looked him up. He was doing a show out there. Got back and maybe a month later, I decided to call his agent. So God had put him in front of me and said, that's the guy. And then about a month or two later, call his agent. So I called his agent and the rest is history. It all kind of snowballed. All the proceeds went to Emmanuel House, and we just completed our second fundraiser this last uh, October. Over $25,000 was raised both years. Serving is what made me a disciple of Jesus Christ. It wasn't until I made that step that I actually got out there and, and kind of got out of that comfort zone that I really felt my heart being changed. Just from taking that first step to watch, watch it open up and, and hurt for people that are hurting and, and care for our neighbors, you know, love our neighbors. It's made me, it's made me kinder. It's made me a much nicer person. It's made me, um, I don't know, more aware of how imperfect I am and how thank God that he gave us his son so we can be saved. Opening your heart to, to really let, let Christ in, seeing a person crying through service that was having a hard time and, and saying, hey, I'm gonna pray for that person today. That's, that's a hard thing to get past and to understand, but you do that all the time now. I do that daily for people. Uh, three years ago, no, I didn't even know how to pray. I think that's that, that sign or that, that little nudge from him saying, hey, this is it, go do this. I always joked with my wife, like, this is crazy, this is really me, I'm coaching Little League, I'm teaching Sunday school and I'm serving on the weekends. Like, who is this guy? <laughs> And again, that's what I think is so cool because I'm just a normal guy. You know, I'm on the journey of faith. I still think I'm really in the beginning. So that's kind of a neat thing too to think if that's what's happened in three years, I can only imagine uh, what's, what's the next 10, 20, 30 gonna be.
that's Scott McCloud on that video, and he's, that, that video is four years old now. And some of you know Scott. I love that story for many reasons. I hope you were paying attention to what the things that he said because there's so much in there that's uh, relevant to our lives, and he's, uh, particularly as we talk about the gifts of the Spirit. Now, a number of years ago, I, I befriended a guy. Scott's story reminds me of this guy. This is why I share it. Uh, whose son was on the team with my son that I was coaching in youth sports. This is quite a few years ago. And I got to know him by some of the other parents. And we, you know, just had pleasantries and exchanged kind of casual conversation. But at the end of the season uh, barbecue, which he hosted at his home, he kind of pulled me aside and said, hey, I'd like to make an appointment with you. He found out I was a pastor, which meant he treated me differently. Uh, and he wanted to, you know, have, he wanted to get together and had, said he had something he wanted to talk about. So we made an appointment and got together for coffee. And he went on to tell me about how dissatisfied he was with his life, his career, and just life in general. And he said, I used to go to church, but even that just felt dull and unfulfilling to me. And then he asked me this question. He said, is this all there is? I mean, you're a pastor. Is this it? I thought, what a great question. It's really how Scott began his story, if you were paying attention. He said, I heard something in one of the sermons where it was, he was being encouraged by the Holy Spirit, I believe, to do more than just show up once in a while. And my friend said to me, I can't help thinking there has to be more than this. And I think when it comes to our experience of faith and our experience of the church, that's a question that's relevant to many of us, isn't it? Is this it? Is this it? Show up? once a week, or for, on average for most of you, twice a month. And, you know, to out of people that you vaguely remember or you've seen for a number of years, and you, you do a little mental evaluation of the service in your head, the music wasn't too bad, the sermon didn't bore me, that was a good day at church, now let's go eat. Is that it? Is this it? Indeed, there is more, I want to tell you. So much more for us that God has. I think one of the challenges for me, and uh, for us, for me particularly as pastor, lead pastor, is to keep us from the inertia of becoming a comfortable, sleepy suburban church. The drift of our culture and of your life and mine is to comfort and ease and thinking about our spiritual life in terms of how I'm be my needs are being met. There's more. There is more. Not necessarily more programs, more obligations, or more events. But there's more to our experience of being God's people in the world than we have yet experienced. God has more for you, more for me, more for us than we can imagine. And I don't just mean someday in heaven. I mean now, in your life, in our life together. This is why the Apostle Paul says that we've all been baptized by one spirit into one body. We're his body. Sometimes I feel like asking God this question. Okay, God, you created these crazy humans. And even though they rebel against you and reject you regularly, you love them and you died for them and you sent your son to do just that and to establish your kingdom on earth. And you decide to use them to build your kingdom. You sent your Holy Spirit to live in each of their hearts and to fill them collectively as your church. You've given them gifts. But so many of these ridiculous creatures, myself included, don't really know what you've given them and certainly aren't using what you've given them or doing anything with it. This is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1, we looked at this a bit last week. He says this, he begins the discussion of spiritual gifts with this statement. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. Now concerning these things, spiritual gifts, your role in the body of Christ, I don't want you to be uninformed. And the word for uninformed we talked last week was the Greek two words, agnoeo, where we get our word agnostic from. I don't want you to be unbelievers or confused about these things. And I want to just review something for you because it's so worth stating, because even though you might intellectually know it, we don't always live it. If you belong to Jesus Christ, that is, you have asked him to forgive your sin and to redeem your life and to, and to take over your life. If that's true about you, I do not mean right now, uh, 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 do you have things you need to ask for forgiveness for? Is your life perfect or not? I mean, have you trusted in Jesus Christ for forgiveness now and forever? If that's true about you, then two things are also true about you. Number one, you have the Holy Spirit living in your life. 
The Holy Spirit has come in as a seal, a down positive guaranteeing what's to come. And number two, by virtue of the Holy Spirit in your life, you have been given gifts to use in service and in ministry. There is no such thing as an ungifted Christian. But there are many who don't know or don't use their gifts. Okay, so also review. What are spiritual gifts? Last week, those of you that are joining us at Kesslinger heard Pastor Sterling preach about this. Spiritual gifts are divine enablements given by the Holy Spirit to every believer for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. Divine enablements given by the Holy Spirit to every believer for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. Now, some of you might have some idea what your spiritual gifts are. Some of you might have no clue that this is all new to you. How many of you took the spiritual gift assessment we sent out this past week, either online or uh, uh, via the app? Anybody? You? I would encourage you to do so. If you have not done it, we'll send it out again this week. So let's talk briefly now about what the spiritual gifts are specifically. The New Testament gives us a number of places where we have lists of spiritual gifts, but no place that's exhaustive. And this is really important for you to understand. There's no comprehensive list given. And I don't even believe if you take all the different lists and put them together, you get a comprehensive list. I think the lists are suggestive. And here's why. Because if you consider the number of different kinds of gifts, and then sometimes Greek words are used overlapping and the gifts intersect. Some words are used interchangeably. Some words are used differently in different lists. And when you consider the different kinds of people, each unique personality and passion area, and when you consider not only the number of gifts and the number of individual, unique individuals, but the number of contexts, individual personal contexts in which those gifts are used, I think the expression of spiritual gifts is almost infinite. It's almost limitless. So it's the, the idea for you is not to find the center of the bullseye, the needle in the haystack, what is my one specific gift? It's to get a sense for how has God wired me to serve? How has God gifted me and created me to make a difference for the sake of his kingdom? That's the bigger question, not like what's my unique special one gift. Now let's look at a couple of these lists and try to make sense of them in brief. First, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 11. This is our text last week, but it's worth repeating here. Verse 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Now, the list that Paul gives to us here in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 11, is a list of what we would call the miraculous gifts. Some would say supernatural, but that all of the gifts are supernatural. All the gifts are more than your natural ability. All the gifts are spiritual in that sense. Some people call these the sign gifts. These are the gifts everybody wants to talk about. And some of you will be aware of this, but in, there are basically two camps or Schools of thought on how it relates to these gifts, miracles, healings, prophecy, and tongues. And I think of this as a continuum, and you should too. On the one hand, there are what we would call hardcore cessationists. Uh, they believe that these gifts have ceased. That's why I call them cessationists. They were given in what they call the apostolic age. They were given at a time to establish the church specific, unique signs and wonders to, to show these apostles have the authority of God and we're establishing the church, the new thing God is doing. But then they, once that church was established and the apostles died out, those gifts no longer operate because they're not needed. That's the cessationist view. Over here on the other end, you have what we would call the continuationist view. Well, they're in there, so they must be operating. And nowhere in the Bible do we see the, any reference that they're at, they've actually specifically ceased. And so we don't want to limit the Spirit, so we're open to all of the gifts. And there's all kinds of nuanced views in between. There are modified views, if that makes sense to you. Some people would say, well, yes, the gift of prophecy exists, but it used to exist to point to Jesus in the future. Now prophecy is to refer to him, you know, looking backward in our culture. It's the gift of preaching. And so we, we redefine them and so on and so forth. Here's where I personally come down on this, and that is I see no reason in the Bible to decide these gifts have ceased. I don't ever want to be guilty of limiting the work of the Spirit. 
And so I would be in the continuationist camp, if that makes sense to you. I want to be open to whatever God has for us in the Spirit. I would also add this little, you know, caveat or parentheses. We do see a lot of abuses sometimes of these gifts. And Paul warns about this. We do see some people abusing these gifts or making them higher than the others. In fact, that was the issue in Corinth. The, the, the wow factor was a big deal to them. And they had elevated these supernatural or special gifts to a, a place that they didn't belong. So I, I would, my personal belief is that all of the gifts are operational because the Spirit's still at work. We're still in the age of the church. And whatever he has, I want to be open to. On the other hand, I want to be wise, measure everything by the Word of God, and not be given to excesses or be led astray. Does that make sense on those gifts? Now, related to tongues, because some of you are wondering, when's he going to talk about tongues? Everybody go, blah, 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 blah. No, don't, this is kidding. There's really three kinds of references in the New Testament to tongues. Number one is what we saw in Acts chapter 2. God giving people, his servants, apostles, the ability, divine ability, to speak other earthly languages which they did not know in order to communicate the gospel. Always to communicate the truth of Jesus Christ. The second kind of tongues, which is referenced here, tongues and interpretation, is God giving someone a heavenly language, which they do not know, to speak, and someone else the ability to interpret it that would encourage and build up the church. The third kind of tongue, which is only referenced in a very cursory way in the New Testament, is a private prayer language between you and God, not to be used in a public setting, but to encourage your own faith in God. I have not experienced that personally, but I know people who love Jesus and are faithful and love the Word of God who have. Let's move on to the next place we see one of the instructed lists. In the same chapter, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administering, and various kinds of tongues. Now this is a shorter list to be sure, and it sounds like Paul is saying there's a hierarchy. There's a list of importance, doesn't it? Paul's given, he says God's given, first of all, apostles. And then like he's ranking them or something. But if you read on, which we don't have time to do in study, Paul says, not all have these gifts, and I'll show you how to live the more excellent way. And then in chapter 13, what's chapter 13? Who knows 1 Corinthians 13? If you've been to any wedding, you know it, right? It's the love chapter, right? It's all about love. Love is the most excellent way. So Paul's not giving a hierarchy who's more spiritual, who's more valuable, who's more important, because he goes on to say what matters most is love. If I speak in the tongues, he says, of men and angels, but have not love, I'm, I'm just a clanging gong making noise. So he's not giving us a hierarchy, he's simply giving us another representative list here of how the church is supposed to function. Okay, let's go to Romans chapter 12 for another such list, which teaches us a couple of other things about these gifts. Romans 12, we'll read verses 6 through 8. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If, prophe if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. I love this little passage here because again, it's suggestive or representative of the gifts. Not all the gifts are listed, but it gives kind of a cross section. But the two words I want you to draw your attention to are right there in verse six. Paul says, we're given these gifts according to the grace given to us. Gifts are just that, gifts according to the grace of God. The fact that you're gifted at all is, is a sign of his gracious love for you, his desire to use you to accomplish his purposes. Think about that. His desire to use you to accomplish his purposes is a gift of grace. It's gracious of God that he would save us. And not only just save us, call us into his family. And not just call us into his family, that he would want to use us. And not just want to use us, but gift us for that service. It's grace. And second little phrase there is that let us use them. Did you catch that? Not let us study them, let us think about them, let us debate them, let us, you know, write them down. Let us use them. And he goes on to say, if your gift is this, here's how you do it. So simple and practical for us. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 12. 
Some have argued this is less a list of gifts and more a list of offices in the church. Nevertheless, Paul talks about how the gifts operate. And he says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. I love this passage. What is, the main thing I want you to see here in this list of gifts is that the role of the pastor or church staff member is not to be the professional Christian. Our culture thinks of it this way, right? You hire professionals for everything. We do this. If you have kids living at home, you hire tutors, you hire coaches, you hire trainers, the best you can get to help your children grow. And we tend to think of the church this way. Ooh, I go to the professional. It's not the, the, the role of the pastor. My role, our role, is to equip the saints. Who's that? The New Orleans saints, of course, they need help. No, who are the saints? You! Every one of you. My, our job is to equip you for what? The work of ministry. It's not the pastor does the ministry and we come and applaud and pay. That's not the church. The, the church is, we're equipping you, each other, for the work of ministry. This is it. This is the whole ballgame. God's vision for the church, his people in the world, is that some are set aside to equip others to grow in their gifts to make a difference in the world. Okay, one of the ways that's most helpful in understanding our spiritual gifts, because I think one of the things I want you to come away with this morning is, how do you know what your gifts are? The spiritual gifts assessment is only just a beginning. It's not the end-all, be-all about who you are. It's just to get you thinking about these things. I think one of the ways that's most helpful, and I've learned this from a couple of people, Sinclair Ferguson's writing and, and, and Timothy Keller's preaching and others, it's been helpful to me to think about the gifts in these ways, in what they refer to as three spheres, or I'm going to call three clusters. Some English words are fun to say. Cluster is one of those words. I just like the word. It sounds fun to say. Is that just me? Cluster. Okay, anyway. I think the word curmudgeon is also fun to say, but it's not relevant at all to the sermon. There's no gift of curmudgeonness. All right, so the first cluster of, of spiritual gifts is what we would call the prophetic gifts. And you'll see a list of the gifts, a table that sort of lays them out here. And, and again, these, this is not all of the gifts. These are just suggestive in these, each area. Let me explain prophetic gifts. Prophetic gifts are the gifts of helping people hear, understand, and respond to the Word of God. I'm doing that right now, hopefully, hopefully effectively. It's teaching. It's prophecy, not future telling. That happened. Long ago, the prophets spoke about what was to come. But now we're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, that all God's promises are yes and amen in Jesus. So I'm not prophesying about something new. I'm speaking about Christ and the gospel and how it relates to culture. That's pro prophecy today. Evangelism is one of my top gifts. These are gifts of coming alongside people to help them understand the word of God. Sometimes it's challenging in your face. Sometimes it's exhorting and encouraging. Sometimes it's instructing and teaching. It takes different shape based on the context, based on the people, based on the one who's doing the work or the individuals, but those are prophetic gifts. Representing God to people. Make sense? Okay, next, priestly gifts. Coming alongside of people and interceding for them. This is not representing God to people, it's representing people to God. Mercy, compassion, healing, shepherding, helps, encouragement. It says heals. It should say helps. I apologize for that typo. Coming alongside of people and loving them, having compassion on them, interceding for them. Priestly gifts. This is the role of the priest, if you think about the Old Testament priest, right? To represent the people to God, intercede for them. Third, cluster kingly gifts. These are gifts of mobilizing, organizing, and inspiring the people of God to do the work of God. Getting stuff done gifts, in other words. Administration, organization, leadership, wisdom, apostleship, and so on. Apostle in the, Old, in the New Testament meant eyewitness to Christ and the, those who established the church. Today, I think the gift of apostleship is like the entrepreneurial spirit. Those who go out breaking new ground for the kingdom, church planting, and that kind of thing. So I think rather than try to look for your one magic gift, think about your cluster. Are you more of the prophetic type of person? Are you more of a priestly type? I just, I, I want to come alongside people who are hurting and love them and help them and encourage them. Are you more of a kingly type? I like to get stuff done. Now, if you look at this, this the Venn diagram here, 
gives us a picture of what in the center? Where all three of those overlap, we get a picture of Jesus. We get a picture of the perfect prophet, priest, and king. He is the true prophet, the true priest, the true king that our hearts long for and that we need. We are called his body, and we're gifted in such a way that when we come together and use our gifts, we give the world a picture of who Jesus is, prophet, priest, and king. Let me tell you a story about how I've seen this firsthand. Years ago, I began as a youth pastor here taking a group of students to Ecuador, and we still go. In fact, my son is going on the trip this year, and it's remarkable. All these years, 18, almost 19 years later, we're still going, and I just praise God for his faithfulness and the longevity and the impact that's been made. The first year I ever took a group there, we visited the Quito City Dump. Now, Quito, Ecuador, is uh, there's over 2 million people. It's a, it's a remarkable city in the Valley of the Andes Mountains. It's beautiful. And it, there's some malls and homes that rival anything in our culture, and there's also some poverty that outstrips anything in our culture as well. It's a end of extremes. The Quito City Dump. So think of your garbage for a minute. Isn't that nice? Think of your garbage. Reflect on your garbage for a minute. When you put your trash out, you don't always see this, but there are people who come by and look in your trash for anything that's recyclable or salvageable. Perhaps you've seen those trucks early in the morning. So your garbage gets picked over. Then it goes to the dump, and there are people at the dump sometimes who pick through it for anything of value. So your garbage gets picked over a couple of times. Stuff that you think is worth throwing out, others think is valuable. In a, in a country like Ecuador, at the time that I first visited, that process repeated three or four or five times, and then there are people, after it's all been picked over, living in the trash, making their homes out of the trash. So dirty they won't give you their hand to shake, they'll give you their wrist because they're ashamed of how filthy they are. Children running to these trucks when they arrive with their mothers to find anything that's boilable, that's edible for their family. Heart-wrenching stuff. The smells were overwhelming. We took a bus there and some of our students couldn't get off the bus because it was too just visually too overwhelming and, and the, the, the smell was too strong. Some did. We had gone to the local market and bought stacks of bananas and oranges as tall as my head to give away and we washed hair, washed little children's hair, gave haircuts, although only those of us trained. A bad haircut's a bad haircut whether you live in the suburbs or the dump. So we, you know, we wanted to... And, and uh, it was just, there was nothing, other than these groups that would go there and try to serve these people and, and love them, there wasn't much happening in terms of ministry there. I came back a couple years later and there was more happening there. And then a few years later when I visited, there was a fully orbed ministry with a clinic and it was remarkable. And I started talking to the missionaries and they said, what began to happen is that those people who came here and were moved with compassion, we must love these people. We must give them medicine. We must give them food. We must get them sanitation and clean water. What kind of gifts are those? Priestly, right? Compassion, mercy, healing, helps, service. That was the impetus. And then others came along and said, what good is it if we only get them fed, but never tell them about the bread of life, never preach the gospel to them, never explain to them about a God who loves them unconditionally? What kind of gifts are those? Prophetic, right? Preach the truth, because they're going to be hungry again, but we can give them bread that never wears out. And so then what happened is that those things were operating as the groups came, but it wasn't organized. It wasn't sustainable. He said, what began to happen is people began to say, there's something happening here, and if we could just bring the right resources and get the right structure, we could make a difference that would, would be, you know, change generations. What kind of gifts are those? Kingly. Leadership, administration, organization. Let's make this thing happen. And I got to see over the course of years exactly that. With, with, they all have to be operating. Pre, you know, priestly gifts of love and compassion, something must be done. I remember one lady, we were on a bus, and one lady who was not part of our group said, I'm so heartbroken. We we're all like, yes, we know. And she said, there's so many stray dogs in that dump. Now, I like dogs, but ooh, come on, right? <laughs> there are starving children in the dump. Deep compassion, desire to preach the truth, and people coming alongside to make it sustainable and organized so that it would be effective. It's a, it's a beautiful picture. And if you go there today, you see a picture of Jesus in action in the dump. That's, that's a little metaphor for what the church is supposed to be in the world. These kinds of gifts coming together to make an impact that could be made no other way. This is why all the spiritual gifts matter. There's two myths, and we've talked about this before, that I think we buy into. One is the myth that I don't need the church. I can have a perfectly fine relationship with just me and Jesus and my Bible and the latest Christian bestseller. No, you can't. No, you can't. 
The New Testament says it from beginning to end. You cannot know God the way he wants you to know him or experience him the way he wants you to experience him purely in isolation. You need the community, the church, the body of Christ. And the second myth is, well, the church doesn't need me. And this is particularly true in our culture. People look around, large church, lots of resources, good things happening. What difference can I make? You're desperately needed. I, this is not a pastoral ploy for more people to rock babies in the infantry, you know. It's for you to recognize that you're needed. God says so. This is why Paul launches into this long explanation about the body. Body parts, eyes and hands and feet and so on. We'll come back to that. Okay, so how do you, how do I discover our spiritual gifts? How do I discover my spiritual gifts? The little questionnaire assessment, as I said, was just a start, just a way to get you thinking about these things. The first thing I would say is to consider your cluster. Are you a prophetic person? Do you love the Word of God, teaching and explaining and to, it to people? Do you love to share the hope of, of, the, of Christ and the gospel with people? Do you love to come alongside people, discern their needs, and speak the truth of God's Word into their situation? Is that, is that what turns your crank? Does that kind of define mostly how, who you are? Or are you a priestly person? Do you, is your heart moved with compassion for people that are hurting? Do you long to bring hope and comfort and healing to them, physically or spiritually? Or are you a kingly person? Do you think that's all well and good, but can we just get organized around here? Can we just bring some systems to this? Can we just get this on the right track? Which is your cluster, your sphere? Second, I would give you another Venn diagram. These little circles are very helpful, I think. Another Venn diagram here uh, with the three A's. And again, I, I borrowed this and I can't remember from whom, but I think it's helpful. Uh, first, affirmation, the top one there. Affirmation, what do others affirm in you? When you serve or have served and you start to do things uh, for the sake of Christ and his kingdom, what do others say? You're good at that. That made a difference. That impacted me. And where do you see impact? Where, where are you affirmed because you see an impact being made or fruit being born? Next, down to the right, moving clockwise, ability. Holy Spirit calling. What am I good at doing? You better answer if it is. <laughs> what am I good at doing? What do I sense God has enabled me to do? What do I really, what gives me joy? What do I like to do? What, do I, what am I best at? What am I, you know, gifted in? And then moving over to the third circle, affinity. Again, this is really the combination of the first two. What, do, what gives me great joy and what am I passionate about? What kind of needs move my heart? What do I have an affinity for? Let me ask you a few questions along these lines. What kind of stories stir your heart? What kind of stories make you, thrill you? Spiritual stories I'm talking about, stories of impact. What compels you or moves you to action? Can you remember a time when you were moved to action? What caused that? What gives you great joy? And this is probably the most important one. As you think about your life and the context in which you live in our church, the body of Christ around you, what are the opportunities or needs that you see around you? And if your answer is, I have no idea, then you need to get more involved and pay more attention. And we can help you with that. What are the opportunities around you? And then last, what are you waiting for? Seriously, are you waiting for an invitation? I invite you. You're invited. You're invited to the party. God invites you. I think too many of us are just waiting on the sidelines for someone to come alongside and say, you can do this. Well, let me say collectively, you can do this. We need you to do this. God needs you to do this. Seriously, the best thing you could possibly do to, to discover your gifts and your contribution to God's kingdom is to start serving. That's the best thing you could do. If, if nothing else, you'll discover your gifts of process of elimination, won't you? Right? I mean, maybe you, maybe you sign up because in the fall they need children's workers. And you go in the nursery and you're like, mm, mm, nope, this is not my gift. Here you go. I right, do something else, right? Like you, at least you'll make an impact for a while, but just start serving. Just get involved. So things happen when you do. You'll begin to discover, I'm good at this. 
I like this. People say this makes a difference. God seems to be using me in this. So get involved. Serve. And I don't just mean, okay, let me just give a couple of common misconceptions here. First misconception is that using my spiritual gifts only counts if it's in the church. This is so not true. Using, we think of it like, oh, this, is, this means that I wait around until there's a program that meets my specific gift area, and then I serve there if I have time. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, I, I heard our church chairman, Dave Prost, told me this story. I think he has a spiritual gift of encouragement. He's not sure, but he's been a great encourager to me. I know he has the gift of intercession and faith and teaching. But he told me a story about w working for his company when they had one of their annual meetings on, on like a, at a hotel resort. And the, the head of the company got up there and talked about what a bad year they'd had. This is supposed to be rallying the troops, right? And it was not at all. It was depressing. He said he walked around the lobby and all of his colleagues and, and co-workers that above and below and at the same level as him were just so downcast and so dis d discouraged. He thought it was just like a walking around in a morgue. He thought God, he felt God say to him, just start encouraging people. So he's walking up to people he hardly knows. Some he does, some he doesn't. And just saying, listen, I'm grateful for you. Tell me what you do. Oh, that makes such a difference. I'm so grateful for you. He said he spent the next day and a half just getting face to face with people and telling them how thankful he was that they're part of the, the company and, and the team. He said people started weeping. People started crying. He said he, he grabbed one guy by the face, which is a little bit weird, and said, uh, you know, I just want to tell you, you matter around here. You're making a difference. Guys like starts to, he said it was amazing how God used that. That's not a program we set up in the church. That's not like I signed up for church duty on Sunday afternoon. That's a man recognizing I have an abil a spiritual ability, there's a need around me, and I can use my gift to make a difference. And he did. Second misconception is what I would call the spiritual gift cop-out. This is people who say, and I'd be guilty of this, well, I've taken the test and I don't have the gift of mercy, therefore I don't have to care about you, right? <laughs> that's not in the Bible. There's nowhere in here that's okay. Like, not having the gift of compassion doesn't give you the right to be a jerk, right? Or, or, I don't have the gift of evangelism, therefore I never have to share my faith. Hmm? Yes, you do. Every one of us has the capacity to make an impact on a number greater than zero. You can share your faith, and you should be. Or, I don't have the gift of giving, so, right? No. So we don't get a cop-out because it's not our gift. We're all supposed to be growing the fruit of the Spirit. We'll talk about that next week and operating these gifts. But some, we have unique sort of abilities that are uh, heightened abilities to make a special difference. Third misconception, spiritual gift projection. So first is, it only counts in the church. Second is, oh, it's like a cop-out. I don't have to do that because it's not my gift. And the third is what I would call spiritual gift projection, Me meaning this. Either we think, well... Why isn't everyone gifted like I am? I, the mix I have is the right one. Sometimes I, people operate that way. More frequently, I notice it this way. Ah, oh, I have shepherding. Why can't I be like that person? I want that gift. I want the, you know, like we, and, and Paul talks about this. There's no hierarchy here. We don't desire someone else's gifts. You, if you spend your time wishing you had somebody else's gifts, and not just their gifts, but their personality and their abilities and their unique way of using them. You miss out on to the joy of who God made you to be. And the church misses out on that. So these misconceptions, I, I, they're rampant, right? It's not, I'm, we're not talking about just church work. In your life, using the gifts God has given you to make an impact for his kingdom and for his glory. Sky Jatani wrote a book called With. I like this book very much. He says there's ways of thinking about our life, that life from God, life above God. He says the best way to think about your life is life with God. When is God not with you? Never. He can always use you. Let me read 1 Corinthians 12, a couple of verses here where Paul sort of ties this together and gives us this image of the body, which is so profound. Verse 18 and 19, first of all. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. In verse 25 and 26 to 27. Verse 
He says that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. Did you hear that? If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. That's important for me. In my, in my spiritual growth, there's been times when I have resented other people's honor. If I'm just being honest, sometimes I've been, the competitive part of Jeff has wanted, is resented when somebody else is honored. That's sin. That's sinful pride. The truth is, I should rejoice when someone else is honored. Why? Because ultimately, it's Christ that is being honored. In verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and miracles. And he goes on. Each one of you a member of the body. When we use the phrase membership, I don't think we know, have a clue what Paul's talking about. You think of membership this way. I joined a club, right? I joined a religious club. The same way, member of a golf club, member of a swimming tennis club, member of a fitness club, member of a Republican Party, member of the Democratic Party, member of the whatever, some guild you're in. And it's just, I joined up, but I'm one of many. That's not at all what the New Testament means by member. C.S. Lewis writes about this, an essay on membership, when he says, it's not simply, I'm just, if I'm one among many. And if you take me away, they just go reduced by one. He says a membership is much, to the New Testament's view, is much more like a family. Father, mother, grandfather, grandmother, son, daughter, cousins, uncles, aunts, dogs, cats, right? All part of this family unit. Not saying dogs or cats have souls. Dogs maybe, cats definitely not. But, you know. <laughs> All part of this family unit. And you can't replace one for the other. You can't take the son and make him into the grandpa in that family. They have unique roles. That's much closer to what Paul is saying here. That's why he uses body parts. You can't replace an eye with a hand. You could, but it would look weird, right? It doesn't work. Every one of you matters, has a contribution to make. You saw that in Scott's story, didn't you? It's a guy whose natural talent and ability and business was building. We thought, okay, you want me to serve? I'll serve. I can use my natural skills and abilities to work at Emmanuel House, and he did. Then he hurt his back bad and had to have surgery, and he couldn't do that anymore. Couldn't lift drywall, couldn't swing a hammer, couldn't run the saw. And he thought, I care so much about this ministry. What could I do? We well, also has a gift of leadership. He didn't really know that. Sits next to a guy named Danny Goki on a plane, who's a Christian singer. Feels the Spirit of God nudge him, call that guy's agent. This is a blue-collar guy running his own business who now has run for four straight years an incredible benefit concert to, to benefit the ministry that he loves. And he started out just answering a call to serve, using his talents. And then in that process, God limits him in one area, and he realizes, maybe I could do this. He's rallying people together. He's fundraising. He's calling other people to serve. He's doing all kinds of things in his spiritual gifts he didn't even know he had that's making a huge difference for that ministry, one of our local partners. That's not something the pastor sit in a boardroom and go, what could we dream up that will help people? That's you, the men and women, the people of God, taking seriously the fact that you have been gifted for ministry. You can make a difference for his kingdom. And the church is not just one less if you don't. It's, infinite, it's damaged. We're missing a part of who we could be. So we'll have more to say about this in the, in the week ahead via the app and some things online. But I just want to encourage you, friends, brothers, sisters, I invite you to get engaged, to get involved. There is no shortage of needs around here, but that's not even all of it. Think deeply about what am I passionate about, what am I good at, and where are the needs around me? And then pray, God, where can you use me? Let's pray. Father God, we praise you for your Holy Spirit who fills us and seals us, reminding us that we belong to you, that we're your children, and who gifts us for ministry. Thank you that the more you have for us is not just someday in our hope that someday when you return, we'll have more. But you want to give us more of yourself, more experience of your grace, more opportunity to make an impact right now, where we are, where we live. We thank you and we praise you, Lord Jesus, for your sake and for the glory of your body. Amen.